Welcome back to Series 3 of the Student Connect podcast. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Nakwanda. And we're hosts for today's episode. This podcast is created in association with Staffordshire University and hosted by our student content team. It is a student-led podcast which shares the experiences of students progressing through university education and inviting experts from a variety of life topics. In this series, we are exploring cultures to grow our understanding and deepen our knowledge about the diverse backgrounds that make up our community. We want you to shape the series. So if you'd like to join us as a guest, email us at comms at staffs.ac.uk or drop at staffs a DM on social media. Along the way, we will endeavour to share our honest stories, sometimes too honest, to help to educate and discover more about other cultures. There may be some sensitive topics discussed. We feel these are important to share to raise awareness of issues. If at any point we use incorrect terminology, please be rest assured that this is part of us educating ourselves and we are not intending to cause any offence. Without further ado, let's get started. So welcome back to the podcast, Naquanda. How are you? How have you been? I'm good. I'm good. And you? Yeah, I've been great, thanks. That's Thank good. Thank you. And the reason why you are our co-host today is that we will be spo- speaking to host Danny, who's actually a guest today. Yes, so isn't that exciting? Really exciting, a really nice switch up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm excited about it. <laughs> In this series, we'll be sharing with awesome places across Staffordshire as we discover more about cultures and backgrounds from our communities. Today, we'll be chatting to Danny about growing up on a British council estate and being the first in his family to go to university. Council estates are social housing products that are a fabric of life in Britain. The background to them is that when soldiers returned from the First World War, they were greeted with homes fit for heroes and given parliamentary accord in the Addison Act passed over 100 years ago. Today, they have provided secure homes for the millions of low-income and working-class people for decades. Many working-class British people have grown up on council estates with a unique sense of community. In 2023, 62.9% of Staffordshire University students were first generation students to go to university. This means that their parents or legal guardians did not attend university themselves. Today, we're keen on learning more about life on council estates and being a first generation university student from Staffordshire University, we have Danny. So Danny, welcome to the podcast. As a guest, um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, Yeah, so um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Danny. I am a final year sports student um, doing my undergraduate degree in PE and youth sport coaching. A little bit more about me uh, in terms of university. I am one of the content creators uh, here at staff. So I'm Commonly usually seen in the, the, the podcast host seat, but I, I'm a guest today talking about the topic, which is something that uh, I resonate with and I'm quite talk about quite passionately. Um, I'm also a part of our sport academy, which is, um, long story short, loaded teaching and coaching, which is basically kind of my career and what I want to go into. So I'm very fortunate that that project is a thing here at Staffs. And I am a born and bred Stokey. Um, and I'm also a first generation um, university student. So um yeah, I've gone. I've gone off the path of the rest of my family members. <laughs> Good to hear, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're at Northwood Stadium today. Could you tell us a bit about our chosen location? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is perfect. It is perfect for me. Um, so I was literally born um, in Northwood, um, not the stadium. Um, it was a street literally probably about two minutes from here. Um, so that's obviously where I grew up. And being a sports student. Um, and being a working class uh, student, being able to come to Norfolk Stadium as a kid was like, it was massive for me and a lot of other students. So I've been here quite a few times, fortunately, because I was, I was okay at sport back in the day, not as much now, I'm getting on a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I, I love this place. So yeah, I've got Northwood, which is where I was born, stadium for sport. Perfect, absolutely Excellent. perfect. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about your background um, of growing up on a council estate? Yeah, so um, obviously I grew up, like I say, in Northwood and Northwood, for those that don't know, is like just outside of Hanley and it's very much a deprived area. And when I say that, I mean, the people that live there have next to nothing. Um, I mean, for me and my family, my mum and dad, uh, my mum will be watching this, so hi mum. Uh, Got to get that in there. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I had a brilliant upbringing. I had two parents that brought me up not dragged me up and I've turned out okay um my dad might disagree but um yeah um 
so that's obviously where I grew up and then I moved to um, near to Bentley, which I'm not too sure on this fact, mum told me, but it's one, it, at the time, it was obviously one of the biggest council estates made in Europe. Oh, so, okay. yeah, but um, yeah, in terms of the background of working class, just as a general sort of stereotype, it's kind of like, we, we get negative connotations quite a lot in the sense that, so not useless in a way, but it's debatable what contributes to society. Yeah. I feel sometimes. Um, but like again, going back to like the Bentley side of things, the people that I've met on Bentley, they would give you anything and everything to help you because mm -hmm. they have nothing themselves. And some of the people that I know that like live on Bentley, it's like, you know, previous classmates or like friends are some of the nicest people because, you know, they have they have nothing else. So yeah. all they can do is be kind in a way. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, like going at school as well. Like, the, obviously, a, a lot of kids were like me, like working class, didn't have too much. Um, but you know, we all got through it, and yeah. you know, we've all gone our different ways, some better than others. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, could you set a scene for us on what your childhood hood home was like and what the community um, was like? Because you said they would help you with anything and everything. Mm -hmm. Do you have any scenarios or cases where that happened? Where you? helped in any way what yeah yeah so um starting off at northwood I, I lived in a very like small terrace house um, and the community there it was a bit of a weird one really because some people were genuinely really nice uh, but some people I, I learned very quickly not to bother with them um, in the nicest way possible um but you know that happens that happens anywhere um but like I didn't have a bad upbringing at all. Like, I had a really good upbringing, and that's massively like down to like my mum and dad. Like I, I can't thank them enough for like how I've turned out. Um, I think I've turned out okay, but like yeah, I, I had a really good childhood, and um, then obviously like moving to a different area, that community was kind of like a cultural shock in a way because obviously like, I live closer towards like the Bentley side of the estate, and then the opposite side is another estate but it's quite an affluent estate and obviously like a lot of my friends that when I move school they live on that estate and it kind of made me realize that they have not had the same upbringing as me and they not had it easy as such but definitely didn't see and go through some of the things that like I had to yeah so yeah it was it was quite a quite a shock but I think I fitted in quite well um, because again, there was still that mix of, you know, people from one side of the state and then the other side of the state, all in like one school. Yeah. So, I mean, you briefly touched on school there. And so how would you say that your upbringing um, shaped your views on education and opportunities? Yeah. So <laughs> in terms of education, up, um, up until about what, like probably year 10, year 11, I, I had no ambition to carry on like with education just in general and I had no idea what I was going to do um so like at the primary school I went to which was close to Northwood it's like on the border of like Northwood Birch's Ed um I remember in year three because I was a, like a working class student I was sort of seen as like a, 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 automatically seen as like a troublemaker in a way and I feel that like I was doubted that I'd be able to do something straight away so <laughs> for example like I remember um, they did like class awards at the end of the year. So they're just like jokey ones really. So like um, who's got the best handwriting, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And this has always stuck with me. They ran out of awards and I was the only person that was left. And so the year three teacher um, gave me class clown award. And oh, my mum still has that certificate um, in her wardrobe and she showed it me a couple of months ago. And like, yeah, I was just like, I mean, she, I don't think she really liked me, my year three teacher. Can't understand why. But yeah, like, it's just it's just always stuck with me. And like, at the time, I wasn't too bothered because I'm a kid, I don't understand anything. But like, looking back, I'm like, I was really doubting like that I wouldn't do anything. Um, and I remember at college, when I was applying for college, I wanted to do BTEC sport and A-level sociology because you had the option to either not just do A-levels or just do BTEC. And I remember one of the admission people laughed at me because I didn't want to do A-level sport. And I'm like, why are you laughing? And they were like, you're more than capable to do A-level sport. And I'm like, I don't want to do A-level sport. I want to do B-Tech sport. And they were like, oh yeah, but B-Tech, you're not going to get anywhere. And I'm like, 
who are you to decide how my future is yeah. going to go? Like, yeah. I, I was really offended. I was like, how dare you? So I just, I was like, listen, at the end of the day, I'm picking that and I'm picking that and you're not changing my mind. I don't yeah. care how much you like laugh at me, blah, blah, blah. Um, other stories for education, go back to the primary. I remember we came here once um, and this, this, was, this was year three as well. This is how much this teacher absolutely hated me. I wanted to do running and I couldn't. I got picked for discus, right? And I can't Quite throw for anything. So if, I don't know if the camera can see, but over there, there is a discus ring. And so basically how discus works is you spin around a bit and you have to throw this discus and there's like a tiny gap that this disc has to go through. So I step up, spin around, hits the side. Spin around, hits the side. Last attempt, all pressure. Spin around, hit the side. I came third in the discus. You know why? Because only three people did it. Yeah. And like, that was so disheartening for me. Like, some people laugh at that story, but like, that yeah. was so disheartening for me because like, I, even, like in, even like in the sports side of things, I wasn't seeing that I could do anything. And like, it was just so frustrating. But so yeah, that was like year three, four and five there. And it was all the same. Like I just, I, I felt uh, it, like it came across and like I was labeled as useless. And I did feel heavily it was because I was working class mm -hmm. and that I was just assumed that Nah, he's a naughty kid. He doesn't want to achieve anything in life. And again, them stereotypes really playing a massive yeah. factor. But then when I moved school, and this is one year of the, at this other school, I associate that as my primary school over three years at the other one because the teacher saw me came in. I was in bottom, like the bottom, not sets, but like the bottom groups for everything. And I worked my way up. And eventually by the end, just before my sats, I was in the top sets because these teachers put the time and effort in yeah. and made me realize that I've got potential and I'm not like this like lost cause. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm, I'm forever grateful that like I moved house and moved area because like that was massive for me. And that's when I realized that like, I do have potential in life yeah. and I'm not just this, no one that's not gonna get anywhere, but also like the sports side of things that really kicked up then. And um, I was actually the fastest in year six and yeah. like it's dead it's dead weird in a way because like at every school up and down the country if you're known as the fastest it's like this high like status yeah. thing yeah it's, it's crazy it yeah. it's crazy i don't know about you two but like at oh, primary school it's like if you're the fastest you're in with the popular kids you don't get bullied anymore yeah, yeah. You, you can you can move to the front of the lunch line like all sorts of stuff like that all because you can run quickly and yeah. like when i moved school like everyone was like wow he's quick um it's just like yeah okay um and obviously i got more into the sports side of things and that's when kind of realized that sports probably the route i want to go down mm -hmm. but um yeah that's a very brief summary of like education mm -hmm. in terms of like primary school specifically would you say that kind of the negative kind of um scenarios and experiences that you've had mm -hmm. had um has kind of pushed you to yeah. do your best like is that kind of if you if you're having a bit of a kind of like rough time or mm. you start to have an ounce of doubt mm. tread back do you kind of refer back to that and use that as um motivation. a driving yeah. force yeah motivation? yeah i think at the time as a kid I, I i struggled to see that i mean like yeah. now there's no such thing as a bad day it's going to sound really cringe i do apologize it's either a good day or a learning day yeah. that's really nice. cringe i'm sorry i, I cut that out no joking no, it's, a good, <laughs> it's a good like outcome that yeah is, but like, like as a kid like it did used to really get me down and like but like now that like, moving forward i kind of realize that like if someone says i can't do something i'm gonna be like well i can and i'm gonna show you that i can yeah um and really try to challenge it and put myself out into them uncomfortable zones and just grow and just not like sit back and say, well, this person said I can't do this. So yeah, that's that. Like, no, I don't care. No, no. And like in sport, you can't, you kind of have to, you have to be like that, like sports. So it, 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 like you're going to have like bad games. You're going to have losses. And like, so I played in goal as a kid. You wouldn't think it because I'm like five foot eight. If you saw me like around <laughs> campus, you know how small I am. So that's why I don't play in goal now. But as a kid, I wasn't that small. Um, and I used to play in goal. And I used to absolutely love it because being a goalkeeper, the whole team relies on you. Yeah. At the end of the day, like you're the difference between losing a match and not losing a match. Because you let a goal in, bang. And every time I used to let a goal in, I'd cry. I would cry my eyes out, pull my eyes out. And I never used to understand why. And my dad would always be like, oh, you can't keep crying. You can't keep crying. Like, it's ridiculous. Like the opposition team's laughing at you. You can't keep crying when you let goals in. And it turns out, because I did, I did um, CBT two years ago, seven months of that, that me crying at them goals was actually my anxiety going off. Yeah. 
And I never, and I never realised it. When I thought about it, it's like, oh, that makes sense. And that's my anxiety thinking like, I've let the whole team down and like just emotionally and mentally, like my body's going like, like alarm bells ringing. Um, yeah. Sorry, I went off a bit on a tangent then, but yeah. No, no, it's um, But yeah, like, the sports side, that was that's what I was on about. The sports side, like the top like performers and the top people, they will always have a positive mindset. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the reason why I didn't make it in sport, in my opinion, is just I didn't have that mindset, but that's because of having an anxiety disorder. So, but like the coaching teaching side, love it. Like you could say, oh, Dan, who got surprised, there's 200 kids go coach him. I would, you wouldn't see a change in emotion from me because I'm just, I'm, I'm that confident that I could do that. It's great yeah. that you found your, um, like a kind of a way to stay in that kind of career. Mm. Uh, career. Um, yeah, I know, I know what you I mean. Like staying, staying yeah, involved, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah staying involved it, um, in it. But find a more maybe tailored role for you and something yeah. that makes you shine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. And you're really good at it. Cause yeah, I've seen you coach um, the kids. Oh, the best, <laughs> but yeah, like the playing side, like I stopped when I was about 15, and I sort of sat down with myself and was like, I'm not gonna make it in this. Like I, I can try, I can try, I can try, but I am not gonna make it in this. Mm. But my dad had some good connections with coaches, um, and so. I went to like a, a like a called like a soccer school. I hate calling it that because I hate calling it soccer, but you can't call it a football school. It doesn't sound as, as good as soccer. But anyway, yeah. and from the age of 14, I was like introduced into coaching and I realized that like, I can be really good at this. Cause like most yeah. people don't start coaching until like after, um, after these, after the playing yeah. and after university. Yeah. So I was like, if I can get exposed to this now, like I'm gonna be way ahead of the game. And so like, yeah, I started that when I was 14 and 21 now. So I've got seven years of coaching experience under my belt and it's helped massively. Um, I did do refereeing at one point, but um, I don't do that anymore just because of how toxic refereeing is. Um, if there's any referees watching, they'll know. But yeah, um, we don't talk about that. So, but yeah, the coaching side of things, loving it. Yeah. And it plays into the teaching as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. So okay. in terms of university, did you feel that you were um, supported by your family and your community or is there any judgment and skepticism mm -hmm. skepticism yeah so? yeah no it's okay um they, they, they were massively supportive especially like my mum and dad because my mum always had an aspiration to I think she wanted to go into like nursing she's like my mum's yeah. always said to me that she just she just wants to help people yeah and she says that I want that to be the same with you sort of like in football we have this term where they say like the parents trying to live through the child's dreams of becoming yeah. football in the same sense that my mum wants to see me in a job role where I'm helping people and like teaching, coaching, I'm developing people all yeah. the time. Um, and she always wanted to do nursing and then she was at college doing uh, health and social care and then at 19, I came along. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of uh, stopped all that. Sorry mum, do apologise. Um, but like even, 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 like, even like that though, like my mum obviously being a young parent, like, I think I think she got a bit of stigma for that. And like now, like at university, I'll tell some, like people will be like, oh, how old your mum and dad? And they'll be like 50, 60. And I'm like, my mum's like just over 40. And then they look yeah. at me like, what? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but like, in my mind, I'm like, but that's, that's I don't see the problem with it. Yeah. And like, I've turned out okay. I'm like, my mum and dad have been brilliant. Like for, for young parents and how I've turned out and like how my sister's turning out. Like, it's been brilliant. But yeah, my family been so supportive. Like, but <laughs> one of the, one of the funny things was was applying for university. Oh my word! I, I don't want to relive through that ever again because like I, I'd be on like UCAS and I'd be like looking at all the questions. I'd be like, Mum, what does this mean? Well, I don't know. And I'm like, I, I need answers. And like, and, I'm, and we're just we're just there. We're like, uh, yeah, probably that one. Yeah, this and that. And it was it was it was horrible. Like I will admit, it was horrible. Sorry if there's any UCAS representatives watching, <laughs> but it, it was it was horrible. I hated it, and I, d I did feel like I was really by myself with that because a lot of my mates mm. had, you know, like siblings that went to university yeah. or the parents went to university. Me, yeah. literally, no one in like my close and wider family have ever been to university. So I had no one to like talk to in a way about it. So. Yeah. Yeah, a bit frustrating, but they were they were they were beyond supportive, and they 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 wanted me to go to university because I think like my mum and dad especially they saw that I had potential to do well in education, especially like again like moving primary schools, I got to top sets, and like throughout high school I was doing okay, in college I got like um, I got a pathway prize, 
um, which was the first, uh, I can't remember what it was called. It's like Pathway Prize for Sport and Leisure, which I think like sort of meant like out of all the sports students at college, I was like top dog. Yeah. So that's 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 right, right on the uh, wall. She's so walking me out. So I'm really proud of that. But yeah, um, they, they were massively for me going to university and I'm like, I'm grateful for it because I was a bit like, mm, if an R in, but no, they kind of convinced me, just like, just go do it, yeah. just go do it, yeah. Yeah. So, like, being a first-generation university student is, um, from what you've just said, I guess, quite challenging, like, mm. trying to work out how to apply. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon that there's a way that um, people like UCAS and things could put specific things in place so that those who genuinely don't have... Um, people around them. Yeah, yeah. the experience yeah. of applying. Do you reckon there's something that they could do to kind of like help that out a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, just like, even just like reaching out. I mean, I know it's hard because they don't know every single first yeah. generation university student, but like, even something as simple as like going to different universities in the area and being like, here's a word. I mean, they might have had this at the time. I don't know. But like, just like a workshop that says, if you have any questions regarding applying for university and you're specifically a first generation student, come here and we'll... And we're like, I mean, I would have been there for at least three hours because I had no idea what any of it meant. Oh, oh, I've got a funny thing, actually, for applying um, for university. I nearly applied straight for my postgraduate because oh, I didn't, no. I didn't, yeah, yeah, I, did, I, I didn't understand the difference between an undergraduate <laughs> and a postgraduate, postgraduate degree. Yeah. And like, but how, how am I meant to know? Because this I don't know that, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just, I'm looking at this and saying, oh, wow, primary teacher with PE specials. I want to be a primary school <laughs> yeah. PE teacher. Yes. And then I read through it and I was like, bachelor's degree what's that so then i googled yeah. it and i'm like oh so i had to go to the person at college i was like i might have accidentally put on my ucas form applying for a postgrad and she went ballistic she's like what you can't apply for a postgrad you college student and i'm like i don't know sorry yeah. so yeah i had to change yeah. it to undergrad but um i mean now i'm a bit more in the loop of yeah. what i'm applying for um but it's it sounds but, yeah. funny but if you don't know yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a completely easy mistake exactly, to make. Yeah. Yeah. and like i wouldn't be surprised if there are other people that are like obviously first generation university students that have been in that same situation where they just definitely. don't really know what they're yeah. applying for. Like, cause that, I, I, I meant to know, you yeah. know. But. That definitely does put a barrier towards applying for university yeah. as well, because yeah. then they feel like they, because they don't know, they're not going to try and try in the sense that they give up because of confusion instead yeah. of yeah. trying something new and having more opportunities. So yeah, I think it would, that's definitely a problem yeah. for first yeah, year yeah, yeah, yeah. students. Especially with the way you've just kind of like said your college reacted to that yeah. like with anger <laughs> instead of know, understanding yeah because yeah. well, like, then that'll stop <laughs> yeah, even if they yeah. put things in yeah. place that again it comes back to that whole idea of mm. made, making like yeah being made to feel a bit like useless because exactly. you've just made yeah. a basic human mistake mm. like yeah. everyone does I, it. I remember crying at my ucas application because it just kept coming back saying this is wrong like that's wrong grammatically that's wrong i was mm. just like oh, just leave me alone <laughs> like at one point i did generally consider i was like right stuff uni i'm fed up with this application stuff but i stuck through it and obviously yeah. like, I'm, I'm here today in final year and I'm, and I'm glad i did stick with it but yeah there have been uh, many tears shed along the way safe to say <laughs> yeah gosh yeah. yeah over the years um council estates have been subject to stereotypical views in media including the royal family shameless and Little Britain, and more recently, the co I mean, this country and Brassic. Uh, what do you think these shows have? What do you think these shows show about working class communities and council state perspectives? And um, how does that resonate with you? Uh, mm. Do you think these representations are true? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, so I'm going to stick with Shameless because that's the one that I've watched um the most and i absolutely love shameless because i do resonate with a lot of parts of that um you know like again like in shameless is like a heavy like pub culture and like yeah. in, obviously in working class like that like, weirdly it's massive like going mm -hmm. to the pub mm -hmm. and like for a lot for a lot of working class people it's like you work throughout the week you get your wages on the friday you spend the wages on the weekend reset and that that that's a common thing that a load of people do and and like a lot of people are like oh what a waste of a life that is but like to me i'm like if that's their life they live that how they want to yeah. they're not doing any harm they're staying out of the way they might obviously say some drunken things but like you know, <laughs> they're not they're not in any harm but um but like for me as a working class student i I'm, I, I don't really tend to like alcohol purely because of like the effect it had on like my granddad um and like he used like a heavy smoker as well, which again, like working class, like yeah. it's, it's a common thing to smoke because it's just like that, like nice, not nice, but like a traditional thing to do. Um, and obviously that, that, that killed him. And like, I was aware of that very early on that like 
heavy use of smoking, heavy use of drinking was literally killing his body. And like, if that wasn't so just accepted within working class culture, I might have got five, ten more years with my granddad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that's how I like to look at it. And like, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, ban alcohol, ban smoking, because if you want to do that, you do that. And like, I like a drink from time to time, but I'm not like other like working class people. It's like drink, 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 mm-hmm. like all yeah. the time. But in terms of shameless, like th- this is specifically the UK one, not the American one. Um, it does portray quite well mental health issues. So mm-hmm. one of the characters is called Sheila, and she has really bad agoraphobia, and like. I have not seen agoraphobia portrayed in a piece of media as well as Sheila is. Um, and like some of the other characters, so like Debbie, who's like one of the young children of like seven siblings, she has abandonment abandonment anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and like Frank Gallagher, he's like got addiction problems. And like for working class people, these, these things are very oh, apparent, yeah. but the problem in working class culture is mental health just doesn't exist yeah. it just it just does not exist at all and like you know when i talk about like my anxiety stuff like if i was if i was like where i am now like 10 20 years ago and i'm saying to people oh i've got an anxiety disorder people turn around to be like either you're crazy or you're just making excuses mm-hmm. and like i'm glad societies move forward in the sense that people understand that now and like the, that's why i like like shameless for example it portrays that but that's not to not to not say that like some of the things are a little bit like over dramatized yeah. but again it's yeah. a drama you're gonna mm-hmm. expect that but yeah like i mean if you want a, like an understanding it is good to watch them shows but i'd take it with a pinch of salt mm-hmm. take it as a very basic yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah exaggerated yeah very version. much very much um so with those sort of like kinds of issues that you've just spoken about um um mm-hmm. like kind of to do with like alcohol and mental health would you say that people in kind of working class council estate areas find it harder to access help for that because i know that so say when celebrities have those sort of um issues yeah they they've kind of got the financial aspects there to try and like get like the yeah the most um professional help that they can Mm -hmm. but when it comes to working class people do you reckon it's kind of push to the side a bit because it's a bit like while they live look at where they live Mm. like um yeah they're doomed to begin with like because pretty pretty much yeah i mean like for working class people they are expected to work hard and continuously keep working because if they don't work they aren't going to survive in a way Mm -hmm. that's kind of like very much like a very high work ethic in the sense that you have to work or you ain't getting anywhere in life Mm -hmm. um but yeah in terms of the mental health side i think people are just so like this massive push for like obviously being strong they kind of neglect that wanting to get help side of things because Mm -hmm. they just kind of put this emphasis on no you got to keep going you got to keep going and like there are probably a load of working class people not just in stoke on trent but up and down the country that have mental health problems and don't realize i mean like myself like i don't i've had an anxiety disorder probably since i was you know probably about 10 11 12 like as i was playing football letting a goal and i cry but i didn't know that until i did my cbt and when i was you know talking about them experiences they said like the therapist said like that's probably been like onsetted by your GAD. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. But like, so, and yeah, like the access to help is another thing, especially for older people, because you commonly do have to pay for the therapy. I mean, I self-referred myself for my my CBT and luckily it was a free like charity. Uh, I think it's called like Healthy Mind Stoke. and like yeah, I had like a load of assessments and seven months was just the CBT, but I'm pretty sure it was like two or three months of just going like through constant like assessments. Cause like at the time mentally, like I just didn't want to be here and like anxiety was that high. Um, so I think that's free for 16 to 23, 25 year olds. I'm not yeah. too sure. But again, if you, if you are needing help and you are within the area, do Google it because like I, I say loads of times, like they saved my life. And like, this was during first year. And I just, I just didn't want to be here at all. Like I had thoughts of not wanting to be here or the S word as people commonly use. And I just, I didn't want to be here at all. Um, and actually I spoke to my uh, course leader um, about my mental health and he got me 
straight onto the student wellbeing service straight yeah. away. And like, to this day, I can't thank him enough because that was the start of like the journey of me getting better. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and he probably thought that was nothing, like not nothing, but in the sense that like, I've just helped a student out. But in a way he did sort of genuinely keep me alive in a way because mm -hmm. like I was getting to the extent where I was starting to like plan not being here um, and just, <laughs> yeah, having very drastic and sinister thoughts. But yeah, I I'm better now. And like, I like, I, and again, I like to be open and talk about that, especially as a working class person, say that you can go get that help. Yeah. And there's no shame in getting that. And I think that's the other thing as well. I think, I think there's a big shame thing yeah. around it, like getting help um, because you know, a lot of people will say like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And they're really not. And like, no, if you ask me how I'm doing, I'll just tell you straight, <laughs> I'm not bothered. Like, if I'm angry, I'll tell you I'm angry. If I'm upset, I'll tell you if I'm upset, you know, and yeah. I'm a lot more open about how I feel. And again, you know, I've had people be like, oh, why are you crying for? Like, even like, like, you know, recently. And I'm like, cause I want to, I'm even yeah, a robot, yeah. man. Like, being, yeah. I want to cry, let me cry, man, you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, it, I think it is hard for working class people to get that help. Um, but hopefully if there's any work my students hear a little bit about my story, then they can go get that help. Yeah, yeah. So it's hopefully. great to hear that yeah. you're doing a lot better mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, thank you, appreciate that. So um, how do you say that um, growing up on a council estate, did it influence your sense of identity in any way? Oh, massively, massively. I, I, I have never not, I have never not, I have <laughs> never been ashamed of being working class. Like I, I knew very early on that, like my mum and dad had to work for what they've got and like they weren't given anything and in the same sense that i wasn't really given ev anything in a sense that like you know massive like finances and stuff like that and you, you do have to work for what you've got um but that's not to say that like my mum and dad haven't been harsh on me because like they, they, they they've been so loving and so caring and like i could not ask for better role models and better parents and just yeah but um in terms of the identity thing like going back to school um, it's kind of a weird one because like when I did sociology at college we did a lot about working class um, boys in schools and that made me realise a lot about my culture um, and about like being working class so I didn't realise just how much homophobic abuse I used to get and when I tell people that they're like but you're not obviously like, you're not a part of the LGBT plus community and I'm like I know but the problem is is that there's two types of working class boys at school. There's the ones that um, understand the working class and they want to do well. And there's the ones that they're called macho working class lads in the sense that like, they don't care what, what yeah. happens to them in life. And what they intend to do is to keep everyone and police everyone how they behave. So how would they do that? Well, for someone like me, I knew I was working class, but I knew I wanted a, a good career and like wanted to go places. And so then you'd get homophobic abuse in the sense that if you were seen to get on really well with your work, you'd, 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 be, you'd get homophobic slurs. Or like um, if you got on well with females, you'd get homophobic abuse. And like, it's crazy that that happened. And in the same sense that like teachers, they were not bothered. They, they, uh, whether they are now or not, I don't know because I'm not a school child, but yeah, like at the time they weren't bothered. Um, but even though that happened, like, I'm so proud to be working class, but I'm at university and yeah. like oft, often sometimes university could not be seen as like a thing for working class, but why isn't it? You know, why, why yeah. can't someone working class or from a deprived area go on and do great things? Mm -hmm. Like it's always baffled me that mm -hmm. as, um, and I think it's like uh, this sort of underlying belief that it's not for you, not for use, not for us, mm -hmm. but uh, like that that's changed now and like and again i'm very glad that society's progressed forward in the sense that there are more opportunities for like yeah. working class people like like me to go to university and like get a career and stuff yeah mm. just a quick question what mm. are your views on success like what is success for you oh that's a great question in terms of life or yeah, like life, a uni oh, okay life I, I mean just in, in a roundabout way, just getting through each day, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, like I say this to loads of people, like, it's great having these, you know, grand big goals or like, the, like a five year plan that they use in business, stuff like that. Yeah. You could die like in your sleep tonight. I mean, I've touched what that done a rapping, but like it, tomorrow is not guaranteed mm -hmm. at yeah. all. And in the same sense that you just got to go day by day and eventually it does build up to that point of time that you're hoping for. But yeah. 
yeah, you just got to take it a day at a time. And like, like with my anxiety as well, like I get myself so stressed, like, right, I've got my career planned out by this, this age, I've got to have this by this age. And it's like, no, no, I don't. Like, just take your foot off the gas of it and just go with the flow. Yeah. Um, but in terms of success, I, I just want to get by. I'd like, I'd like to replicate like what my mum and dad have done with mm. like my little nuclear family yeah. and just, just have a nice, a nice house and high, household, a nice household that I can bring my own children up eventually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just show to them that no one can tell them what to do in the world. And yeah. like their <laughs> destiny potential <laughs> is down to them at the end of the day. Yeah. And that if someone does tell you what to do, you laugh at them in the face and you just go do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I completely get what you mean about the career plans mm-hmm. um, side of things because I've literally just had a module where the assessment was creating a career plan. Yeah. And one of the examples that they gave on how to like lay out this portfolio and then also do a presentation about mm-hmm. it was, um, think about what you want to do in, within the next year, then five years, then 10 years. And I was looking at it and I was like, I know what I know my end goal, yeah. but I'm not going to limit myself to time mm-hmm. because yeah, I want to yeah. be a film director. Mm. If I only ever direct one film when I'm 50, mm-hmm. I've done it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of approached it in um, this is my short term plan, this is my mid term plan, this is my long term plan, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to say how many years, years like give or it, how much yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because like things can get in the way, like mm-hmm. family and all of those yeah, exactly. things. And like, Speaking of success and things, I think as long as I'm happy with what I've done and I've got no regrets, then who's to say I'm yeah. not successful? Yeah, yeah. You, re- you, know really I mean? you really shouldn't put time limit on things. And like, you know, I know t- time's always running out. Uh, there's no denying that. But in the same sense that like, you know, when I was like, again, like going back to primary school, even like high school, I didn't know I was going to university. Now, like I'm a lead coach on a project with other coaches and like, like the other week I got to deliver a coaching session to Spanish students in Madrid if you'd have told 12 year old Daniel he was doing that he'd laugh you in the face and tell you where I go honestly yeah and for like a working class person like that that's massive and like to some people like some people on the trip were obviously like oh yeah I've, I've already been I'm already going to do this place this year this place that was my first time abroad that was my first time abroad and yeah. I absolutely loved it. It was a massive culture shock because like, I spoke to a few people and they were like, oh yeah, don't worry, most Spanish people speak English. They, they don't. <laughs> um, don't blame them because it's a complicated language. And I, I had to quickly adapt and just like pick up even just a few little Spanish words here or there just so I could like get by. Because um, for example, we got on the bus, we tried to go to Madrid city centre. So obviously we get on the bus saying like, oh, uh, Madrid city centre, please. Bus driver just starts shouting at us in Spanish. And I'm like, mate, you speaking normally, I'm not going to understand. So shouting at me is just making this <laughs> 10 times worse. Um, but, you know, I adapted and got through that. Um, yeah. But yeah, like like that opportunity was, was massive for me because I, I never thought I'd be able to do something like that. Yeah. And like, like, I didn't feel out of place either. Like the Spanish students, like they were really appreciative of me and like they were asking me more questions. They were asking like how I got to these places and like these students that we were working with on their module, they were from all around the world. So I'm talking like South Africa, Kazakhstan, Russia, like you name it, one of the students was there and they were asking me about my journey. And I'm like, it should be me asking about your journey in like the traditional sense, because you've come from a different country and you're studying a different country. I was like me, I'm just this working class lad that likes to shout at people and tell them do this and do that. You know what I mean? And it, it was, it was, yeah, it was a nice feeling that they kind of wanted to, know like my side of things and like how I got to where I am so yeah it was nice but yeah like that opportunity was immense so thank you to the SU global team um because they, they, they yeah it was so good it was so so good <laughs> sounds like you had a great time yeah yeah it was brilliant uh, so do you have any advice that you would give to first generation students from a working class background um that want to pursue yeah oh god where do I start firstly if any university you're thinking of, they should have like sort of like a, a help, like helpline in a way, like people that will help you. Mm-hmm. So just get in contact with them. And if you are struggling, they will help. Um, because I, I I wish I knew that. And I was like, now I know being at the university, they do do that. I was like, oh, that'd have been really good for my UCAS application. I mm-hmm. uh, would have to you know, be crying. But again, like if it, whatever university you're applying for, 
make sure, like, just check if they've got a helpline because, like, people just, people want help anyway, you yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and don't be afraid that if you're the first person going to university that you're not going to be, like, the, f the very first person ever because you'll find more people that are first generation students mm -hmm. and like even people that have had like siblings that have gone to university or aunties uncles whatever it's still their first time as well yeah. and just their their experience at university is completely different to what your experience is going to be so uh, get involved with as much as possible like say projects if there's any projects on your course get involved with them because like you know i got to go to madrid the other week so and i wouldn't i wouldn't have ever didn't get involved in a project so ask for projects and just put yourself out there but don't don't be someone that you're not try, don't like if you're working class you are working like don't try to be someone that's like <laughs> upper class middle class i don't know you know what i mean like mm -hmm. just be yourself yeah that's like that's that's the best thing you can do because then people know the true perception of you yeah. that's some really good advice mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. There you go. I'll go into it. I'll go into careers next. <laughs> <laughs> so a huge thank you to Danny for joining us as a guest today. Oh, it's no, been it's great okay. having you on. My How's pleasure. it been? My pleasure. Oh, Different. I've loved it. I've loved it. <laughs> I, fun, I, 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 it? I could talk for Britain. So <laughs> I talk about a, a topic I'm passionate about as well. Like, I'm surprised it's not like dusk out here. You know, like no, there's no sun at all. I'm surprised it's still light to be honest. But yeah, no, I really, really enjoyed it. Really appreciate it. Another huge thank you to Naquanda for being on. <laughs> a really lovely yeah. co-host it was lovely I love it thank you to Tiff oh yes. thank you as always the reliable, reliable. Yeah, every, every single time <laughs> yeah. oh no I'm not <laughs> but we move on <laughs> uh, thank you to Northwood Stadium who kindly let us use their incredible location today um, Northwood Community Sports provides facilities for a range of indoor and outdoor sports including track and field athletics football netball basketball and racket sports at northwood stadium in stoke and trent um it also has a well-equipped gym uh it aims to encourage participation in sport and leisure activities by all sections of the community in stoke and trent and north staffordshire as part of an active and healthy lifestyle and of course thank you to you our listeners <laughs> sorry i'm gonna fly fly my eye oh my god <laughs> sorry <laughs> Oh, what the f There it is. Look, he's there again. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Right, I'll show up now. And of course, a huge thank you to you, our listeners. Oh, is it me? Oh, oh I didn't wanna... realise I was going. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Cut that out. Okay. Uh, thank you to the Staffordshire University Media Centre, podcast producer and production editor. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, then send us a direct message on social media. To find further support at university, you can visit staffs.ac.uk or your Student Connect team. Don't forget to tell us what you think about the podcast so far, what you'd like to hear on it, and if you have any questions for us, please tag us on any form of social media at staffsuni or hashtag the Student Connect podcast on any form of social media. Goodbye. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs>